So we mentioned earlier, and, and I think you guys are aware, that this year, this evening, for the uh, first time, we are going to be uh, presenting a, a dinner we're calling the Future Music Honors. It's going to be from 6 to 9 at the Hamilton downtown. And we're honoring three different categories of individuals who have done work in the music community that we think is, is, is particularly important and really worth showcasing. We're going to be presenting an, a, uh, an award to Wayne Kramer and his work at Jail Guitar Doors to get music into prisons and try to transform lives uh, through the power of music. We are, and, and we're going to be hearing from Wayne uh, tomorrow here at the conference, and tonight he's putting on a, a pretty incredible rock show. So hopefully after the dinner you can uh, have the energy to, to go see him play uh, with, a, with a ton of amazing guest artists. We also are shining um, a, a focus on something that happened in Washington, which is actually very timely. Um, it took about 10 years for four congressional leaders, Senator John McCain, Senator Maria Cantwell, Representative Mike Doyle, and Representative Lee Terry, to lead a fight that reauthorized the Federal Communications Commission to create an entire new class of non-commercial low-power FM radio stations. Those uh, radio stations are, there's an application window coming up uh, now in October, and non-profit uh, groups, uh, educational institutions, and others are applying for the stations. Because of their bipartisan work uh, and collaborative work for a decade, we're going to get 1,000 new non-com radio stations. And I think in, in a time in Washington where it feels like absolutely nothing can get done, I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty amazing symbol of, of what can happen when people from different political parties just roll up their sleeves and go to work over a long period of time to do something great on behalf of the music community. So we're going to be honoring those uh, leaders tonight. Yay. And I would like to bring up our friend Linda Blossbaum to talk a little bit about the other group that we are going to be honoring. Linda? Thank you so much, Michael. You know, I think this last panel really exemplifies how challenging it can be in the public policy arena to grapple with some of these tough issues. And you can just imagine how difficult that would have been 15 years ago uh, up on Capitol Hill when the, the technology was just starting to kind of reshape the contours of the music industry and all of the complications that came with that. And so tonight at the inaugural dinner included in the honors that Michael just outlined, we will also be honoring um, four individuals that really sat um, at the center of those negotiations and contours and just were really stand up individuals to represent artists and creators' rights throughout. So tonight, uh, receiving the Voices of Advocacy Award are um, Ann Chadovich, who just very ably uh, was the moderator at the last panel, uh, John Simpson, uh, Patricia, Pe um, Patricia, I'm sorry, uh, Pollock, and Hal Ponder. Um, all were fierce champions on behalf of, of artists and creators' rights, and they really did so much to kind of create the world that we live in today, including um, creating and managing sound exchange. Um, they pressed policymakers to consider musicians' rights in all debates that happen on Capitol Hill, and they fiercely fight um, every day to have fairness in the radio industry across several issues. One of which Michael just outlined. It's been a it's a long road. Um, they have always tackled this with a spirit of respect, collaboration, and they've always focused on the facts. And as a person who's had the honor of working with all of them through the trenches of several debates, um, we are all very lucky that they have been a part of these debates in the past, and um, they will receive their tribute tonight. So we'll look forward to that as well. Thanks, Michael. So that was quite a panel, one of my favorite types. Um, when it comes to digital music, our next speaker has been pretty much everywhere the action is. Tim Quirk was, of course, a member of the much beloved band Too Much Joy, and then went on to chart a course as a digital music executive at the time when a lot of folks were still trying to figure out how to program their DVR. Tim is now the head of global content programming at Google Play, and he's here today to offer up some insights he's gleaned from all his years at a rapidly changing and increasingly tech-driven music world. Please join me in welcoming Tim Quirk. Oh, 
Hi, everybody. I'm going to read at you. And you will be thankful that I am not doing this extemporaneously, trust me. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, this is a presentation, it's sort of in two parts. The first part is some general stuff that I've learned over the last 15 years of being in this business and watching everything change seismically. And then the last third is really uh, some very specific practical examples of how I've applied those lessons in my current role and some previous roles. Uh, I don't want it to come across like it's a commercial for Google Play. It's not meant that way. Um, but I want to actually put my money where my mouth is and show you how I'm using some of my theories here. Uh, so I had a whole paragraph telling you who the hell I am and why you should listen to me, but Kristen just did that. So I'm going to skip that part. Uh, I will say I've been watching the music business respond to the perils and possibilities of digital distribution for a good long time from a variety of different perspectives, and I've become pretty opinionated on the subject. But before I spout some of those opinions, I want to start with one I don't share. It's a typical and to me typically depressing reaction to the recent explosion of online music services. A blogger for The New Yorker posted something uh, last year that... Uh, made me sadder and sadder each time I saw someone retweeting it approvingly. It was supposedly about the tyranny of choice and how on-demand music services have made it harder to fall in love with music by making it too easy to listen to anything you feel like. But the piece was really about how much fun the writer used to have, spending hours in record shops that are now closed, hunting for LPs he could take home and slowly fall in love with, and how much he misses the experience. In other words, it was soaked in nostalgia. If the writer were 80, I'd give him a pass. But I'm pretty sure he's younger than me, so fuck him. <laughs> I mean that. I've been spending more time and money than I could afford in record shops since Jimmy Carter was president, and I've been getting paid to figure out what aspects of that experience can and can't be replicated online since Bill Clinton was getting impeached. And you know what that means? It means I'm old. That doesn't mean I don't consider my experience important. It is. If nothing else, it's convinced me of one inviolable rule that everything else I'll say today flows from. Don't fetishize the past. I'm pretty sure that's just good advice for living a happy life, but it's also my rule number one for the 21st century music business in general and for digital music merchandising in particular. Don't waste time trying to find online analogs for offline experiences. As I've mentioned, I've been in the online music business since there's been an online music business. And that article exasperated me so much because the writer was just repeating a chicken little cry I hear regularly, and I heard it all morning long. We're devaluing music. It's amazing how often people invoke that word devalue as if it means something. It doesn't. You know why? Because you can't devalue music. It's impossible. Songs are not worth exactly 99 cents, and albums are not worth precisely 9.99. When I hear people complain about discount pricing in online stores or fret about on-demand services such as Rhapsody and Spotify, I rebut them with another rule of mine that makes me sound like a hippie, but I promise I'm not. Music is priceless. I mean that literally, and I believe that even more than I believe old people should shut up about how much better things were in our day. Here's why. The same song will always be worth different things to different people at different times. The online music revolution hasn't changed that. It simply made the fact glaringly obvious. You can sketch this dynamic with a simple pyramid, showing lots of people spending little or no money at the bottom and fewer people spending lots of money at the top. If you're a new band, you begin at the bottom of that pyramid. But no matter how popular a given artist gets or how amazing her latest single is, there will always, always, always be more people in the world who don't care than who do. So the goal for every artist and every song has always been to climb this pyramid, convincing as many people as you can along the way to part with something in exchange for listening. At first, you just want their attention. The next step is to get them to give you some money for the privilege of hearing your song whenever they happen to get the urge. And as you keep climbing the pyramid, you find yourself with fewer and fewer listeners, but each one who remains is happy to give you more and more money. These fans, the best fans, will buy alternate versions and deluxe editions, they'll come to every show, they'll get buried in a kiss coffin, etc. <laughs> None of this is new. What's new is that the casual fans no longer have to buy if they don't want to. 
And while there's a lot of very real and quite justified angst that there's not enough money coming in from everyone else to make up for that loss, those casual listeners are also exhibiting an unprecedented hunger for more and more music. That is not automatically a good thing, but it is a massive opportunity. So what exasperated me about that New Yorker article was the writer's seeming contention that because he no longer has the same experience digging through crates and falling in love with a hard-won find, he's stuck at the bottom of the pyramid for everything, forever. His worry doesn't only bother me because I have a very low tolerance for nostalgia. It also upsets me because if he's right, it means I'm failing at my job. That job has gone by different names on different business cards for different companies over the past decade. It's variously been called editorial, music merchandising, or content programming. But whatever you call it, the object's the same. We're here to help you through that maelstrom of musical choice. We're here to pull people up each level of that pyramid. But we don't do it the old-fashioned way, by anointing a handful of artists' geniuses and declaring selected albums masterpieces. We do it by building services uh, that let thousands of potential masterpieces find their ideal audiences. That's one reason my job's name keeps changing. It didn't really exist before 1998. We're not exactly record store clerks, we're not exactly critics, and we're not exactly DJs, although our ranks include people who learned what they know doing each of those things. But in order to do whatever this job is well in the 21st century, you need something none of those professions are particularly known for. You need to be very, very humble. Well, you need some arrogance. You still need to think you know more than the average radio listener about the history of at least one genre of music, who's influenced whom, which of them ruled, which of them suck ass, and why. But you also need to recognize just how little that matters anymore. It doesn't matter the way it used to, because now that anyone with a laptop and an internet connection has a global airplay and distribution network at her fingertips, there's no such thing as a gatekeeper, and everybody's a tastemaker. At the same time, though, that explosion of content has created a new, less sexy need. Telling the entire world what it should or shouldn't listen to has become far less important than simply making this overgrown musical jungle navigable. Online music services need bushwhackers carving paths from one starting point to another. We're not gatekeepers. We're not tastemakers. We're park rangers. Being a park ranger means our job isn't to tell visitors what's great and why. Our job is to get them from any given thing they like to a variety of other things they might. We may have our own favorite paths, and being park rangers, we probably even prefer the less crowded ones, but our job is to keep them all maintained so visitors to our park can choose their own adventure. They might not feel our hand on their backs as they wander, but it's there. It's just subtle. So how does that work in practice? Here are three guiding principles. One, there should be no dead ends. Two. There should be different recommendations for different people. And three, context is more useful than opinions. Principle number one means that wherever a visitor lands, there should be multiple trails leading someplace else. Principle number two means you point each visitor to the trail he or she is most likely to enjoy rather than the trails you wish they wanted. And principle number three basically means no one cares what you think. It's more important to give people some background information on what they're listening to than it is to tell them whether you personally like it or not. Now, those are my principles. Not every music service uses them, and it would be a boring universe if they did. But I think those three are the best for making the abundance of choice liberating rather than paralyzing, without precluding the chance that anything can happen. Imposing order on chaos is particularly important at the bottom of the pyramid. I've labeled that the free tier, and it's true that's where unlicensed peer-to-peer -peer services operate, but free in this context doesn't have to mean the copyright owners aren't making money. It just means the listeners themselves aren't paying. The free tier of Spotify lives here, as does YouTube, sites like Last.fm, Pandora, Broadcast Radio, NPR's music website, and numerous other dis music discovery blogs. I could have put anybody there, but NPR music is my favorite. Um, I've, lifted, I've listed those in rough order of the amount of human or dynamic curation listeners encounter at each one. They exhibit a range from practically none on the left to 100% manual programming on the right. Importantly, as you go from left to right, you also give up on access to more and more of the total available catalog. Peer-to-peer -peer and Spotify leave you on your own to wander the musical wilds, while tastemaker sites only want you to listen to the specific music they're featuring at any given time. You see a similar pattern in the next two tiers. Online music retailers can range from a thin layer of not particularly targeted merchandising at iTunes 
to much more personalized but largely algorithmic recommendations at Amazon, all the way to the strategy of using big name music critics, to the extent that music critics are big names, um, at eMusic. Uh, On-demand subscription services such as RDO, Rhapsody, and the forthcoming Beats, likewise, each use different methods to slice and dice their massive catalogs. Some rely on label-provided data. Some try to leverage social recommendations. Some invest in proprietary editorial, and all mix these different ingredients in different proportions. There's value in all these approaches, but I'm kind of like Goldilocks, and I'm always looking for the one that gets the balance just right, and I'm pretty sure it's in the middle. Tastemaker sites save listeners a lot of work, but they also preclude happy accidents where you stumble across something totally random and amazing on your way somewhere else. So when I've helped build merchandising teams and systems from Listen.com through Rhapsody and onto Google Play, our first step has always been to devise something that can cover 100% of the catalog dynamically and then let human experts polish as many of those results as they can. The killer services, in my experience, are never the ones that cluster songs using algorithms designed by astrophysicists, any more than they're the ones that brag about how many musicologists are wearing headphones in their basement. The most useful online music services are the ones that arrange the best marriages between brilliant robots and unpredictable humans. Here's one very specific example of how that worked. Back when there was an online music store in the real player, we realized that album pages were dead ends. Customers who landed on one either had to buy the record or hit the back button. We wanted paths forward from the page, so we looked into how we could populate them with similar albums. We wound up writing a pretty simple formula that recommended albums released within four years of the seed record by contemporaries or followers of the seed artist. The good thing about this formula was that even though the results were generated dynamically, all the seed data had been entered by our in-house music nerds. The results weren't perfect, but they were different from and better than anything competitors were offering at the time. And they did us the service of populating results for millions of albums. That gave us the breathing room to go polish the results for our top thousand artists by hand, detecting, deleting any recommendations that didn't look obviously right, and inserting the type of suggestions actual record store clerks might actually make. We're taking a similar approach in All Access, Google Play's on-demand subscription service. We've had a team of experts create key tracks playlists for hundreds of genres. I built this classic soul one, which leads off with William Bell's You Don't Miss Your Water, a song that pretty much set the template for Southern soul ballads in 6-8 time. These playlists are then used by Google's brilliant machine learning team to help train the algorithms that drive our genre radio features. Here's the playlist the last time I launched the classic soul station. And this is a dynamic set of recommendations, which will, and it will keep playing me classic soul indefinitely. It will go on for weeks and weeks if I never turn it off. And I don't know if you can read that, but trust me, it's solid. I like it. In my experience, most effective online music merchandising is like that. It's simultaneously obvious and involved, simple and janky. It straps music geek trivia to engineering geek rocket science, lights the fuse, stands back, and hopes the explosion doesn't hurt anybody. Most people focus on the explosion, on the moment in high fidelity when Jack Black rips into the clueless dad who dares to ask for the wrong record. But rocket science at heart is a pretty mundane affair, and people on my team spend most of their time doing our equivalent of calculus, mucking with metadata. It sounds boring, and it is, but here's another guiding principle. Metadata is merchandising. I cannot stress this enough. My teams have always spent more time entering and editing metadata, artist album and track genres, original release dates, distinguishing singles from LPs, edited versions from explicit, anthologies from main releases, etc., 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 than they devote to anything else. It's not very glamorous work. At Rhapsody, we used to refer to it as digging holes in the ocean because it never ends, but it is critical to maintaining a useful service. It's also a reminder of the first rule we started with. Don't fetishize the past. This is the problem. Any online music service that relies on metadata to cluster artists, albums, and tracks is only as useful as that metadata is correct. And most metadata is shockingly, horribly wrong because even today it tends to assume online stores are just like brick and mortar ones. Since I have no desire to embarrass a competitor, here's an example from my own store, chosen simply because I stumbled across it while preparing this presentation and took a screenshot before fixing it. The original release date is wrong. Though this expanded release did indeed hit shelves in 2002, the release date should be 1980, unless anyone here thinks an auto-generated playlist of 2002 prom hits would benefit from having Rock and Roll High School play right after Nelly's Hot in Here. 
While Mick Rock did shoot the cover image, listing him as an artist is just confusing here. Most importantly, though Joey Ramone might be briefly happy to see his creation filed under pop, I doubt he'd appreciate seeing Maroon 5 crop up as a similar artist, which is the type of thing that happens when partners feed us data that made perfect sense in a physical record store 33 years ago, but is utterly useless online. Any online music service has to figure out how to address endemic data errors like these. The truly useful ones devote serious time and attention to the issue. If you get that piece wrong, nothing else matters. Doing this right is also, I'm convinced, the best means of cheering up that moping New Yorker writer. Because online music services are not corner record stores and should not pretend to be. This is an opportunity, it is not a loss. Sure, making it easier to discover new music means the percentage of music that moves you out of the total amount of music you hear is going to shrink. But can that really change how much you like your favorite music? I doubt it. And if hearing more music than you ever could have previously means merely liking but quickly forgetting a greater number of songs, that still sounds like an excellent bargain because it's guaranteed to mean you wind up loving something you never would have heard otherwise. Or almost guaranteed. It's my team's job to make sure. And now that I've given you a general idea of what I think my job is and why I think it's important, I'll offer some more specifics of how my team and I go about it. This is the part that's going to sound like, vaguely like a commercial. I promise you it is not. Um, especially this next paragraph, which is, sounds braggy, but it's just facts. Um, okay, we start, as I said, by being humble. Because Google Play is built into Android and because there are over a billion Android devices in the market, with another one and a half million phones and tablets added to that number each day, we eat, sleep, and breathe a reality other music services are just starting to understand. Our customers live on their devices. The mobile market is massive, and a huge slice of that consists of brand new customers. That's profound reach, and it's not something anyone at play takes for granted. On the contrary, it's very daunting, and our very daunting job is to keep all those customers satisfied and happy. We do that by understanding the pyramid. If you turn it upside down, it looks just like a funnel. And we've learned both the power and the limits of our reach by watching those tens of millions of casual listeners funnel into play. Music promos on Play's homepage see insanely high click-throughs, but not earth-shattering conversions. Whereas promos on mu Play's music page, which is to the left of it, right of it, I'm backwards, uh, Let's see, yeah, see less total traffic, but much higher conversions. And that's the pyramid in action. The folks visiting Play Home may be on their way to find apps, games, books, or movies, and have only a passing interest in music. So as you can see, we catch their attention with free and discount features. Whereas the people clicking through to music have indicated a specific interest in hearing some, and are much hungrier for whatever we put on the buffet table, so we can get a bit more specialized in what we offer. Recently, we've been experimenting with more robust merchandising on genre pages, and sure enough, the same rule applies. Fewer total visitors, but the ones we get tend to spend a lot more. This has been particularly good news for country, which has always underperformed digitally compared to its physical retail market share. This is a problem that has vexed me for over 10 years, because we know there's a huge fan base out there. And with a few Taylor Swifty and sized exceptions, my competitors and I have not effectively catered to them. Country features on play were consistently underperforming relative to other genres, and it was making us sad. Genre page programming has turned that around. Our country homepage is now our best performing genre page, and genre page promos in the aggregate now generate more revenue than music promotions on play home. We've also been investing in original content, which can be as simple as James Blake telling us about his favorite things, or as involved as a six-part series with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, in which they licensed us a half dozen never released concerts from the band's archives, then reminisced about each individual show for our cameras. Worth noting here is that even the Stones, one of the biggest acts on the planet, recognize there are still more people who don't care about them who do, which is why on Play Home you see us enticing casual fans with a, with a free track, while deeper down we've got a 35 minute documentary for the folks who hang on Keith's every word. Again, at the risk of sounding like some self-help guru, I have to invoke the power of that pyramid. Everything we do ideally offers something for people at each level. We launched a huge Clash promotion last month that included unseen interview footage with the late, great Joe Strummer, along with a brand new interview with the three surviving members of the band to promote Sound System, a $75 eight-disc box set. We knew that would appeal to Clash fanatics like myself, 
but we also made sure we prominently featured the double disc greatest hits collection for more casual fans. And we tossed a few free covers of Clash tunes by contemporary bands to coax in the merely curious. None of that devalued the Clash's music. Rather, each piece of it offered different types of listeners a handhold to encourage them to climb a little higher up the pyramid. That's why Antenna, our monthly developing artist feature, focuses on free tracks. The first thing we need to get these artists is listeners' attention. And free helps. This is important. It's not enough on its own. Antenna has recently become our best performing feature in terms of total download performance, but two years ago, it was one of our worst. We've been tweaking the formula. How many new artists, on what cadence, with what combination of placements throughout play since we launched in 2011? And we'll keep doing so, because getting people to pay attention to something new has always been hard work. And it's only getting harder as the amount and, I think, the quality of the competition explodes, while the ability to listen to something else instead becomes even easier. Capturing people's attention and then hanging on to it is the fundamental challenge for artists and labels and their managers in the 21st century. So whenever you hear someone pontificating about music's new world order, including me, ask yourself if the stuff they're insisting on is going to make capturing that attention and turning it into something lasting easier to do or harder. But also make sure they're not just trying to wish the present away. That New Yorker writer was lamenting the ease of discovering new things. And while that makes me very impatient, it's true that the unlimited shelf space, unlimited shelf space is both a blessing and the curse of digital distribution. The internet stocks everything ever recorded, including not just every out of print single and LP, but all kinds of music that's never been commercially available before. So you're not just competing with your contemporaries. You're competing with the entire history of recorded music as well as a nearly infinite present. That's scary, but it can also be exhilarating. If you're an artist who tours incessantly, changes up the set list every night, and has a fan base eager to hear every minute variation as a given tune evolves night after night, we can put that on our shelves, and we can do it in something very close to real time. Not every fan wants that, of course, nor does every artist. But again, no two fans are alike. If you want to treat them all the same, you still can. It's a mistake, but you can. But if you want to embrace the new ability to engage different types of fans in different ways, people like me are here to help, however we can. If you're self-released, you can upload your music directly to play. Set your own price. If you're on a label, make sure they're delivering to us. Make sure your metadata is pristine. And reach out to me to figure out how we can get creative together. Whatever we do together, please understand that music is never just a commodity to us. We're fans first. Our mission is to turn average citizens into crazy music nerds like us. Digital distribution in general, and play in particular, give us unique power to make that happen. And we take that responsibility very seriously. Thank you. Should we... Should